What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we're breaking down a new study on intermittent fasting. You know, every time a fasting study or a keto study or an artificial sweetener study comes out, we at BioLane kind of lick our chops a little bit because we just know it's gonna get a lot of engagement whether it's good or bad. I wanted to highlight this study because it is kind of a unique study for a few different reasons. Now, the first thing is it's one of the most well done free living studies out there. There's a lot of free living studies where people are really kind of left to their own devices and not given a lot of guidance. This study had the control of almost like an in-house study while letting people kind of live their normal lives. So it's kind of unique in that aspect and, and how they set the study up as well. Another thing is they were using alternate day fasting rather than intermittent fasting. So many of the studies out there kind of use a 16-8 or a 24 or in terms of a weekly schedule, a 5-2 setup of fasting versus non-fasting. Invariably, if they don't show what the fasting enthusiasts want it to show, they just say, well, it wasn't, the fasting period wasn't long enough. Or if you're the snake diet guy, uh, you know, it's gotta be at least, you know, a day or two. This study is one of the first studies that I'm aware of to look at alternate day fasting versus just straight caloric restriction on a lot of different measurements. So let's talk about the study. What the researchers did was first off, they recruited healthy, subjects between the ages of 18 and 65. So this wasn't a study on obese people. I think they kind of wanted a proof of concept before they take it into obese. And they wanted to look at, all right, if we continuously calorically restrict, meaning they eat the same calories every day versus alternate day fasting, but still the same amount of calories per week, as well as another group that was doing alternate day fasting, but wasn't calorically restricted. So the way they set this up was the continuous calorie restriction group was eating 75% of their maintenance calories. So whatever amount of calories it took them to maintain their body weight, they ate 75% of that every single day. The alternate day fasting group ate 150% of that amount one day and then zero the next and just alternated that. So again, on a overall basis, they were eating the same amount of calories, but changing how they distributed them. And then the alternate day fasting group that was not calorically restricted was doing 200% of their maintenance calories on one day and then 0% the next and that alternated. So what this was gonna do was a few things. One, you have a really good control for the calories because they're equal between the 75, 75 and the 150, zero group. This is how they described them. Uh, and then you also had a control to look at are some of the effects from intermittent fasting or alternate day fasting due to the fasting itself or the imposed caloric restriction. Because if it was a fasting mediated effect, we would expect to see it in both of the fasting groups, but not so much in the continuous calorie restriction group. So kind of cool how they set these up. They also took a lot of measurements. We're not gonna talk about all of them, but we're gonna talk about the main ones. So obviously they measured body weight, they measured uh, fat mass, they measured lean body mass, they measured uh, some body water measurements. They also looked at uh, energy expenditure, basal metabolic rate, physical activity, and like I said, a lot of other stuff. They actually looked at some really cool stuff with substrate oxidation, which we're not really gonna get into. It's cool if you're a super geek, but I think it's beyond the scope of what is useful for most of you guys. Now, before we get into the results of this study, I want to talk about how they set the various groups up because it was actually a really well-designed study. So when we do studies, typically if it's a good study, what we do is we randomize people. Now, what does randomization mean? Well, the reason we randomize is so that we can be relatively confident that any effects we're seeing between separate groups is due to the treatment and not that one group just happened to have more of certain traits than another group. So for example, if you didn't randomize and you just threw people into a group based on your whims, maybe you would actually have one group that had more fat mass than another or another group that was more active than another, those sorts of things. So what they did was a block randomization where they randomized based on what was called their fat-free mass index, which is basically a, a measurement of body fatness and their physical activity, which I think is super important because it is very possible since they were gonna measure physical activity, if they just randomized based on fat mass and not physical activity, it's possible they could have had one group 
that are just naturally more physically active than, than the other group and they wouldn't have known. But because they took a four week period where they monitored these folks and just saw what their normal lifestyle was like in terms of food, food selections, calorie intake, and their physical activity, they were able to randomize based on their fat mass and their physical activity. So again, we can be relatively confident that whatever we're seeing in the results of this study is due to the treatments and not due to the fact that one group just had randomly more people that had X characteristic. The other thing that was cool about this is they made sure that these folks were weight stable. So they monitored their intake and made sure their weight did not go outside a certain range in the lead up to this study to make sure they one, knew exactly what their maintenance calories were and two, that they weren't in some kind of flux. And in fact, they actually eliminated a few participants that would have gone to the trial because their weight was not stable. So again, a very, very detailed, well-designed study. Now, what did they find? The study was only four weeks long, which is a limitation, but again, very highly controlled. What they found was that both groups lost about the same amount of weight. So the 75-75 continuous calorie restriction group lost about the same amount of weight as the alternate day fasting group. Now the alternate day fasting group that was not calorically restricted, the 200-0 group, they didn't lose any weight from baseline not statistically significant anyway. And both groups, the 75-75 group and the 150-0 group lost significant body weight compared to the 200-0 group. Really interestingly, the 200-0 group didn't really have many improvements in various metabolic markers, whereas both the continuous calorie restriction group and the alternate day calorically restricted fasting group both had benefits. So this seems to suggest that there's not really necessarily an inherent benefit to fasting if you're also not calorically restricting, that at least a good portion of the benefits of at least alternate day fasting seem to come from the calorie restriction rather than the fasting itself. Now, here's the really cool part of this study. Even though the weight loss was similar between the alternate day fasting group and the continuous calorie restriction group, the continuous calorie restriction group actually lost significantly more fat mass and basically all the weight they lost was from fat mass. Whereas the alternate day fasting group lost pretty much 50% from fat and 50% from lean tissue. So the, the continuous calorie restriction group lost a kilogram more fat mass compared to the alternate day fasting group. Now there could be a few different reasons for this. The first being that something I've talked about a lot is that protein distribution is important for maintaining lean body mass. The research seems to indicate that you cannot make up for low protein at one period by overeating protein at another period. And that's because the body doesn't really have a viable mechanism to store protein. Whereas dietary fat can store in adipose in basically unlimited amounts. Carbohydrate, you have a limited storage capacity, but you can store about 400 grams between your liver and muscle glycogen. Whereas the body's amino acid pool is very, very small. And some people have said, well, you, you, you kind of store it in muscle. Muscle is not a storage component for amino acids. That's like saying, I built a house and that's a storage component and reservoir for wood. You don't build a house so that then you can tear it down to get the wood out of it. You have a woodshed. <laughs> Muscle is your house. Your woodshed would be your free amino acid pool. Well, the free amino acid pool is extremely small and is not sufficient to store enough amino acids to maintain anabolism during long periods of fasting. And we've seen this with, with previous fasting studies before intermittent fasting was even really a thing. They showed that Fasting past about eight hours would decrease muscle protein synthesis, start to increase muscle protein breakdown, and would increase nitrogen excretion. So this data kind of fits with the mechanistic data we have. Now I will say not every intermittent fasting study shows a loss of lean body mass. So I wanna be clear on that. However, this study and a few others have and I tend to bias towards this study because it was so well designed and because it was so tightly measured. Another reason I tend to put more emphasis on this study is because of how much attention the researchers paid to details. So one of the drawbacks to DEXA, which is how they measured lean body mass and fat mass, and it is the gold standard in research, but DEXA is what's called a two compartment model. You have fat mass, which is one of your compartments, and then you have fat free mass, but fat free mass encompasses pretty much everything except fat mass. So we're talking fluid, bone, 
muscle, organs, all this kind of stuff shows up as fat-free mass. So many times I've seen research where I've said, well, they just had a loss of body water compared to the other group. Well, I'm gonna read this straight out of the study and I think it just shows how much attention to detail the researchers paid. Although lean soft tissue mass includes components such as water, glycogen, and the non-lipid component of adipose tissue. So adipose tissue actually has some lean body mass or fat-free mass because it's not just all fat because you need various lean pieces of proteins and whatnot to hold the tissue together. Uh, and, and they find that that gets reduced a lot through dieting. So that's that's just some background on that section. Although lean soft tissue mass includes components such as water, glycogen, and the non-lipid component of adipose tissue, the latter being automatically reduced by fat loss, pre-scan fluid and food intake were carefully standardized in this experiment and any remaining effect on the lean portion of adipose tissue would be relatively minor. So they actually standardized the types of meals the people had so that there wouldn't be a large difference in body water. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call attention to detail. In fact, part of the pre-study monitoring procedure for this was they looked at the foods and the meals that people tended to eat and basically put together meal plans for them that was just the same foods they were already eating and just reduce the calories accordingly. So again, really close attention to detail. Yes, it could have been water, but it's unlikely based on the fact of how standardized they made this. So it's highly likely that it was actually some fat-free mass that was lost in this alternate day fasting group. Now, the other really cool part of this that I think is important to bring up is while they didn't show a difference in basal metabolic rate between the two diet groups, they actually did show a significant reduction in total daily energy expenditure in the alternate day fasting group. People get confused by this. Uh, our friend, uh, Dr. Jason Fung was confused by this because he thought that your basal metabolic rate was the same thing as your total daily energy expenditure in that video we uh, broke down a while back. But your BMR is basically the energy cost just to keep the lights on. So the way they measure BMR is you literally just lay down, you're not sleeping, you just breathe, and they look at how many calories that requires over time, and then they can extrapolate that out to a 24 hour period. So it's literally the cost of keeping the lights on. Whereas your total daily energy expenditure is your BMR plus your physical activity plus the energy cost of assimilating food called the thermic effect of food. Now, when people hear physical activity, they just think exercise, but physical activity isn't just exercise. In fact, your exercise, your daily exercise is usually the smaller component of your physical activity. So your physical activity encompasses exercise, but also what's called non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that is things like what I'm doing right now. I'm waving my hands around, I'm moving, I'm shifting around. Believe it or not, those small movements that occur during the entire day actually can add up to a significant amount of calories. And they found in this study that that particular component of energy expenditure was significantly reduced in the alternate day fasting group, whereas it was not reduced in the continuous calorie restriction group. This isn't something where the researchers were like, oh, you know, you guys go on a treadmill and you guys, you just do nothing. No, they told them to just continue their normal lifestyle patterns. And remember, they randomized them based on physical activity. So at the beginning, both groups had the same amount of physical activity. So this is actually pretty cool because this is a spontaneous subconscious reduction in physical activity. Now, the authors speculated that it could be that those folks who are doing the alternate day fasting subconsciously were preparing themselves for that 24 hour period of fasting by reducing their physical activity, even though they didn't realize that they were doing it. What does all this mean? It doesn't mean you have to throw intermittent fasting out as a possible tool for reducing your body weight or losing body fat. It still is a tool. In fact, the people in this study had benefits from intermittent fasting or alternate day fasting, but it wasn't independent of the calorie restriction. It seems to be tied to the calorie restriction. And if your goal is to maintain as much muscle mass as possible, then intermittent fasting or particularly alternate day fasting is probably not the best approach for you. 
So again, some people say, I don't care about maintaining my muscle mass, even though I would argue that you should, because people who have more muscle tend to have a lower rate of weight regain. There's all kinds of data that indicate that people who have more muscle mass are basically healthier on almost every level than people who have lower amounts of muscle mass. And the longevity data especially is very, very interesting. Uh, in fact, they show after age 65, you can almost predict how long someone will live based on their, your hand grip strength as well as your lean body mass. So again, I would argue that you do want to maintain your lean body mass, but not everyone wants to look like me. So if your goal isn't to be as muscular as possible, then intermittent fasting is probably a good option for you. But if your goal is to maintain as much of your muscle mass as possible, or for example, you are an athlete and performance is very important for you, or you're a bodybuilding competitor or a power lifter or you know, some, some sort of athlete, then I would say intermittent fasting, especially alternate day fasting is probably not the best approach for you. Maybe there's an intermittent fasting period like a 16-8 where it's not long enough of a fasting period to where you start to lose appreciable muscle mass. But again, we really, have, we really don't know that yet because the studies are, are kind of mixed. I would say if you like intermittent fasting as a tool, if it feels easy for you to stick to and you can adhere to it as a lifestyle, by all means do it. I have no hate towards intermittent fasting despite what people on this video will say. In fact, my wife does intermittent fasting. Now she doesn't do it because she thinks fasting does something magical for her. She does it because when she's competing, like right now her calories are down to 1300 calories a day. And if she has two meals instead of three or four, she gets to have a decent sized meal. But if she had four meals, those are some pretty small meals. So she just chooses to fast until about 1 PM so that she can have a bigger lunch and then a bigger dinner. One more thing I want to point out. Many proponents of intermittent fasting, specifically Dr. Jason Fung, say that you should do intermittent fasting because calorie restriction slows your metabolism. This study directly measured that. One, in terms of BMR, as we already talked about, they showed no difference between these two groups. And this is supported by literally every study that has measured BMR in an intermittent fasting versus continuous calorie restriction group. There's no differences. But in terms of total daily energy expenditure, the fasting group was actually worse. So again, there's no evidence to suggest that intermittent fasting is somehow superior for preventing metabolic slowing. And in terms of your total daily energy expenditure, it might actually be worse. All right, guys. If you wanna check out the full paper for yourself, link is in the description. Also, all my educational stuff, the workout builder, carbon diet coach, it's all in the description. Go check them out and I'll catch you guys next week.